You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Support for today's episode of Evidence Locker comes from Noom, helping people around the world enjoy healthier lives through better nutrition and exercise. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence. We'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Best Fiends, a world on your mobile. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature, and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Galicia, Spain, is known as the land of a thousand rivers. Apart from rustic coastal fishing towns, you'll find the haunting villages in the hills. The hills are adorned with pine and eucalyptus trees. The view from the top looks down at rivers snaking through the valleys, rushing and sparkling. Summer days are long and warm, whereas winters can be somewhat unpredictable. Rain, snow, sunshine, that's Galicia for you. The morning of January 19th, 2010, it was icy cold. Dutch farmer Martin Verfonderen decided to take the nine-mile journey to Obarco de Valdeoras, where he did his weekly shopping. Volunteers staying on his organic farm handed him their lists, and he said he would be home in the early afternoon. They watched him drive off into the fog in his green Chevrolet blazer, past the house of his neighbors. To say Martin and his neighbors did not see eye to eye would be an understatement. The Rodriguez family had been living in Santa Uea for generations. Then, Martin and his wife Margo moved in with new ideas and new farming methods. They were at each other's throats about anything and everything. Martin even went so far as to call it rural terrorism. Martin usually recorded his interactions with his rivals, but on that day, he did not run into them. He just drove past and kept on going down the meandering mountain road in the mist. Afternoon came and went and there was still no sign of Martin. The guests on his farm raised the alarm at nightfall. Police searched for months on end, but it seemed that the earth swallowed Martin whole. His wife Margot suspected that something sinister was behind her husband's disappearance. If only the hills could talk. It would be four years before she found out what happened to her husband on that cold and misty morning. German-born Martin Verfonderen was a naturalized Dutch citizen. He moved to the Netherlands at the age of 17 to avoid having to do compulsory military service and trained to be an electrician in Amsterdam. Martin was an eccentric who wasn't afraid to speak his mind. He was a passionate environmentalist as well as a member of Amnesty International. Amnesty International's website states that their members are volunteers who are called on whenever human rights are threatened. It reads further, Their actions, big and small, put pressure on governments, institutions, and decision-makers to do the right thing. Martin met his wife, Margot Poole, at a protest rally against a local council in Amsterdam. The council wanted to develop a new neighborhood, and protesters fought to preserve historical buildings in the area. Martin and Margot had the same outlook on life, and before long, they decided to get married. Margot quit her office job, and the couple set off in their camper van traveling through Europe. They hoped to find a spot where they could settle down, ideally a piece of land where they could enjoy a self-sustainable living. They wanted to live off the grid, somewhere they could do as they pleased, without anyone telling them what to do. In 1997, two years into their trip, Martin and Margo decided to explore Galicia, the mostly uninhabitable northwest of Spain. Most people had moved away from the small hamlet because of a lack of work and resources. 
Close to 300 villages were left abandoned as their inhabitants swapped the waning farming industry for better opportunities in Spain's cities or abroad in Cuba and Argentina. The charm of the Galician hills lured Martin and Margot to the deserted village of Santa Uea. It was somewhat of a ghost town, with about 60 empty and crumbling stone homes. Martin was convinced that this village, immortalized in the film Semper Shansha, was the best place to set up camp after tasting the water. After a couple of days, they knew they had found their home. The little town in the valley was romantic, filled with potential. Perfect. The peace and quiet of the town was Martin and Margot's idea of heaven on earth. The Dutch couple befriended the only permanent inhabitants of the village, the Rodriguez family. The Rodriguez family had lived in Santa Uea for generations, on the same property at the entrance to the village. The patriarch of the family, Manuel, or Manolo, was in his 80s, and people from the region referred to him as Ogafas, the one with the glasses, because of his signature bottle-bottom eyeglasses. Manolo was married to the jovial Javita, and they had four grown sons. Two of the Rodriguez sons had moved away from the area, but came to visit often. Then there was Julio, who lived in the nearby town of Patin, but worked on the farm so he was in Santa Uea every day. 30-year-old Juan Carlos lived and worked on the farm. When Carlos was a child, he fell off a horse and suffered a head injury, which caused the mental disability. He had the intellectual and emotional maturity of a 7- to 10-year-old boy. When Martin and Margot arrived in Santa Uea, Manolo advised them as to which property was the best one to buy. It was on the other side of the One Street Village, only a short distance from the Rodriguez's home. They bought the property with the main homestead in ruins. Martin and Margot rolled up their sleeves and started renovations themselves. They learnt Spanish and the more colloquial Galician. They learnt a lot about the local customs from rebuilding their home. But the house was not their primary focus. They researched how to survive from the land and how to grow organic crops from scratch. They had no experience but were up for the challenge. And so, their organic farm called Central Amihula came to fruition. Julio Rodriguez helped them to get their crops going by supplying sheep fertilizer. He was somewhat amused at their way of doing things, with their focus on sustainability. But he said that as long as they didn't bother him, he didn't mind them. The Rodriguez family was happy that there was some life in town again. It was nice having people close by. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Now, I don't know about you, but I use apps for everything. And Noom is an app that helps you to achieve your weight and health goals using psychology. Mind blown, right? Noom knows that everyone is different. So if you sign up to improve your lifestyle, they are there to help you figure out something that will work for you. You can keep track of your exercise, your meals, and it even suggests delicious and nutritious recipes. Your goal specialist and community group are a text message away, all there to motivate you. Evidence Locker producer Sonia has used Noom for a couple of weeks now. Let's check in and see how she's doing. Hey, Sonia. Hi, Noel. Yeah, so Noom has helped me to gradually change my habits for the better. I'm halfway into my program and I'm right on track with my weight loss goal. All the while, I'm still eating things that I love. Maybe just a little bit less or a healthier version of it. And I'm getting a trained eye when it comes to portion size. Bottom line, Noom works. So why don't you give it a go? It's really very simple. Sure is. What do you have to lose? Join this challenge with Sonia and visit Noom.com forward slash evidence to start your trial today. That's N-O-O-M dot com forward slash evidence. Now, back to today's episode. Martin Forfondren soon made waves in the local community with his ambitions to create an organic farm in Galicia. He said in an interview with a local TV show that he envisioned his farm to be an ecological center that resembled Noah's Ark, with a wide variety of species as well as plants. And it went well. They grew beautiful organic vegetables. Everything was going according to his plan. Martin and Margot spent their days working their fingers to the bone. At night, they sat by a campfire playing the guitar. Sometimes it was Martin who played, and other times it was Margot. They were at peace, happy. When they needed money, Martin, an electrician, would go to the Netherlands to do a couple of jobs and make some money, while Margot stayed behind and tended to the animals and the crops. 
During summer months, the Dutch couple welcomed volunteers to their farm who were looking for farm experience. They taught the visitors organic growing methods, and before long, Central Amehula had a good reputation in the international organic farming community. People took sabbaticals from their office jobs to visit and work on the farm. Martin and Margot welcomed it because keeping a farm is hard work. Martin saw the potential for tourism because of the natural beauty of the area. They were inspired by the town of Santa Uea that bore ghostly reminders of all its residents long gone. Every single building was in ruins, with rubble crumbling onto the main street. Martin and Margot tried to clear up the roads and repurpose the rubble by building stone walls and such. But Manolo stepped in, reminding them that they did not own the buildings. Therefore, they did not own the stones. They couldn't understand why he would oppose their efforts, seeing as they were cleaning up the town. But Manolo didn't want it to be cleaned up, because that meant tourists would come, and that tourists could decide to stay, and then his peace would be destroyed. Manolo was very clear about the fact that his foreign neighbors were newcomers. They should know their place. Martin struggled to understand Manolo's mentality, as his intention was to restore the town within keeping of its history. He was respectful of the place, and he truly loved it. It seemed like the initial harmony between the sole inhabitants of Santa Ueo was over. The neighbors no longer shared food and meals, as their differences became too troublesome for them to pursue a friendship. The Dutch couple's peaceful life in rural Spain was about to come to a crashing halt. Tensions built slowly, but surely over time. At first, the conflict was about boorish annoyances, perhaps something that could be attributed to cultural differences. But over the years, the situation became hostile. Manolo was set in his ways, and Martin was an outspoken environmentalist. So the two of them were like fuel and flame. Martin called the octogenarian a fascist, or little Saddam of Santa Uea. Martin claimed that his neighbors had stolen from him a butane cylinder as well as 25 liters of diesel. This incident led to Martin installing security cameras all around his property. He said that an invisible hand would release their rabbits or push a mule into the corn and potato fields, destroying three months' worth of food. Martin reported incidents to police, and the feuding neighbors became regulars in the local courthouse, airing their grievances. During one hearing, Martin said, This is also my town, and I am not leaving for a little Saddam. Manolo and his family were also not happy with the influx of tourists Martin's farm brought to the area. In a year, about 30 volunteers came to Central Amehula. It maybe doesn't seem like a lot, but to someone like Manolo Rodriguez, every new person posed a threat to his way of living. They disrupted the peace, peace he had before the Dutch couple moved into town. He said that they were wild people and disapproved of their farming methods. The conflict between the Rodriguez family and their Dutch neighbors came to a head towards the end of 2008. It all started with a disagreement about a 355-hectare piece of land. The hillside that overlooked the village had always been communal space, owned by the town of Santa Uea, but Manolo had claimed it as his own. But it wasn't as simple as that. A local mill felled mature trees in the wood and had to pay a percentage of their income to the village. The bylaws of the town state that this money should be shared by residents or used to maintain and improve the village of Santa Uea. The land provided an income of about 72,000 euro annually. This was a lucrative source of income for both families, something worth fighting over. Manolo felt that because Martin and Margo were foreigners, they had no right to the money. Manolo proclaimed himself president of the village, but Martin wouldn't have it. He said Manolo could take whatever title he chose, even Sun King, but with that came responsibilities, like improving the town and sharing the money as was the law. This quote from Martin stating his case. Manolo believed himself to be lord of the mountain and tried to impose his law of terror, sitting with his staff at the door of the house. The Dutch couple knew their rights and went to court to fight their neighbors. The matter went to court in 2008. Martin and Margot pointed out that the law was on their side. According to the law of Monte Vecinal and Mano Comun de Galicia, to be a resident of Santa Uea, property owners must work in agriculture. They must have had livable home on their property for at least 10 months and have lived there for a year. 
At the time of the court case, Martin and Margot had lived in the home they renovated for 11 years. They won the case, and Manolo Rodriguez was ordered to pay them what was due. Needless to say, the Rodriguez family was not happy and appealed the court's decision, but their appeal was turned down. Another dispute was between Martin and the mayor of the region, Miguel Batista. Martin was unhappy with the lack of amenities in the town of Santa Uea. Due to the bad state of the rural roads, garbage collection trucks didn't even bother making the rounds to some properties, including his. Martin insisted on an infrastructure that would be deemed basic by European standards. Asphalting of roads, garbage removal, clean water. He said that if his requests were not answered, he would take it further, even write the King of Spain a letter if need be. His biggest complaint was the open-air refuse site that polluted the stream from which his goats and sheep had their water. Seeing as the only other residents were the Rodriguez's, his complaint was obviously about the way they disposed of their garbage. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Now, you've heard me talking about Best Fiends. If you haven't, you'd better go back and listen to some more Evidence Locker episodes. Best Fiends is a puzzle game for everyone. It engages your brain for a couple of minutes at a time in exciting challenges. It's the ultimate distraction if you're waiting to meet someone or need a break between work tasks. You don't need to be connected to the internet to play, so as long as your phone is charged, you can escape into the fun world of slugs, diamonds, treasures, and fiends. I downloaded the Best Fiends app from the Apple App Store for free. It is also available in Google Play. Honestly, Best Fiends just keeps getting better and better. I've now reached level 140, moving on to the ominous ocean after my time in the endless desert. At the moment, I'm battling it out with the boss slug. Best Fiends updates the game monthly with new levels and events, so it never gets old. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, back to today's episode. Martin felt it would be prudent to make video recordings of his neighbors. He filmed their efforts to sabotage him and Margot. One instance was when Javita and Carlos were caught on film spraying pesticide on Martin's crops the crops that he took every measure possible to grow organically. Before long, confrontations grew physical. Martin reported the family for attacking him with sticks, sickles, and an axe handle. He said that Carlos, whenever they fought, got worked up and yelled, I'm going to get the rifle. When confronted by these allegations in court, the Rodriguez family claimed that Martin once punched Javita and had attacked and injured the elderly Manolo on another occasion. They had no proof of this whereas Martin had photographs of injuries inflicted on him by his neighbors. The Rodriguez family had 14 firearms in their home, and Carlos was rarely seen without a weapon. He even slept with his favorite shotgun on his nightstand, even though he did not have a firearm license. Mayor Batista, aware of the conflict, but unwilling to intervene, jokingly said to El País newspaper, I hope that the blood does not reach the river. A couple of weeks later, tragedy struck. On Tuesday, the 19th of January, 2010, days before Martin Forfondren's 53rd birthday, he disappeared into thin air. He left home between 9 and 10 a.m. in his rickety old U.S. military-issued green Chevrolet Blazer to do his weekly shop in a nearby village. After shopping at Lidl Supermarket in Obarco de Valdeoras, he loaded his groceries in the truck and headed to a local bar that doubled up as an internet cafe around 12.30 p.m. He emailed someone who had applied to visit the farm as a volunteer and confirmed that it was okay. He logged off, got back into his truck, and headed back home, via the town of Patin. His green blazer was seen at the traffic circle, turning onto the meandering road leading up to the hills in the direction of Santa Uea. Margo was visiting family in Germany at the time, helping aging uncles to transition into assisted living. So when Martin didn't make it home by nightfall, guests staying at their farm in Santa Urea called Margot. From Germany, Margot contacted local police and reported Martin's disappearance. She drove back home and arrived two days after Martin was last seen. A search team scoured the entire area. Helicopters and police divers were brought in, 
but there was no sign of Martin. Police had to consider the possibility that Martin had reached a breaking point and that he left of his own volition. Margot drove around the windy mountain roads for hours on end, looking for him. Her first instinct was that he had had an accident and that his car had rolled down one of the steep roadside cliffs. But she could not see any sign of Martin or his recognizable vehicle anywhere. People around Patin speculated that Martin left while Margot was away, so she wouldn't know where to find him. They said this because his car was missing too, so it looked like he drove off somewhere. Margot had her moments, wondering if he would leave her like that. But in her heart of hearts, she knew that their marriage had a solid foundation, that they were happy. They loved their life together, and if he wanted to end things, the always outspoken Martin would have said so. There was no way he would have stolen away and left her wondering what had happened to him. Julio Rodriguez regretfully told Margot that he saw Martin with a blonde woman. He was sure the Dutchman had run off with this mystery woman. Another theory put forward by the Rodriguez clan was that something more sinister was at play. Drug traffickers were rumored to use the passage of abandoned villages like Santa Uea on their route through northern Spain. Jovita speculated that Martin was either involved with the drug smuggling ring or that he had come into a crossfire somehow. The Rodriguez family did, however, pay Margot 10,000 euros after Martin disappeared. This was part of the money that was due to her from the communal land. A reward of 50,000 euros was offered for any information that would lead to finding Martin. The Civil Guard provided Interpol with Martin's information, but that did not yield any results. Police searched for three months, but with no clues as to the Dutch farmer's whereabouts. They had to call it off. A memorial was held for Martin a year after his disappearance, on January 19, 2011, in Patin. Margot bravely recited the eulogy in Galician. My husband, my friend, my partner a stubborn man who always wanted to do things his own way, but also a man with a big heart. I hope the day comes when we'll know what happened, as not knowing is the hardest part. Martin, I don't know where your body is, but your spirit is here with me. From the start, it played on her mind that their only neighbors had something to do with his disappearance. But then again, would they actually have harmed him? Killed him? Margot did not know, but chose to keep her distance. The homesteads were in close proximity to each other, and she planted hedges to try and keep her privacy. She did not want to have anything to do with them. In the weeks after Martin went missing, an insurance broker friend of the Dutch couple, Maria Jesus, told police an interesting story. She said that in the days leading up to his disappearance, Martin paid her a visit. He had sold some goats and wanted to use the money towards a life insurance policy. According to Maria, Martin said, I'm afraid that my neighbors will do something to me. Before she could process his application, Martin vanished. Margot also knew that Martin genuinely feared for his safety. He had asked Margot to move back to the Netherlands if anything should happen to him. He said, Just bury me in the earth with a sign reading, Here grows Martin, the Dutchman from Patin. However, after his disappearance, Margot stayed on in Galicia, running the farm they had started together. She was hoping that maybe someday he'd come back, or that she would at least find out what had happened to him. It wasn't only Margot and her friends who suspected the Rodriguez family. To investigators, Martin's neighbors were suspects from the very beginning. But other than the fact that they didn't get along, there was no evidence linking the family to Martin's disappearance. When questioned, they simply shrugged their shoulders and said they assumed he'd gone back to the Netherlands. Javita even said that the feud wasn't as bad as everyone made it out to be. In fact, she rather liked Martin. If that was true, the feeling was not mutual. During legal procedures before his disappearance, Martin described his relationship with his neighbors as rural terrorism. He complained that his neighbors often threatened him. He said that they also provoked him. For four years, Martin's absence cast a shadow of doubt over the hamlet of Santa Uea. It was an unsolved mystery, but life had to go on. Margot welcomed volunteers and kept the farm running. Locals purchased her produce, and she did what she could to stay afloat. Then, in June of 2014, the case broke wide open. 
A Civil Guard helicopter patrolling the area looking for bushfires in the pine forest below experienced technical problems and landed in a clearing in the woods. Once on the ground, they spotted a glint. It was unusual, as there were no other signs of civilization anywhere close to them. The location was only accessible using fire breaks and meandering mountain roads. The crew went closer to inspect and discovered a burnt-out green Chevrolet Blazer, with its number plates removed. Inside, they found a laptop and a cell phone. And then, a couple of yards away from the car, they found a human skull. The Civil Guard was called to the scene, and as soon as they saw the car, they knew. They had been looking for the Green Blazer and its owner for years. At the site, investigators found the remnants of a campfire. It was clear that the perpetrator had set his victim's body alight, most likely to erase the evidence. It was impossible to tell if Martin was murdered at the scene or if he was already dead when his body was dumped there. Only some parts of a skeleton were recovered, reasonable after being exposed to the elements for so long. In 2010, shortly after Martin's disappearance, Margot provided police with a toothbrush and a piece of used dental floss from which police were able to extract a DNA profile of her husband. They were able to get DNA from the femur at the scene in the woods which gave them a match. They had finally found Martin Fonderin. This was a homicide investigation. Police looked at their prime persons of interest, the Rodriguez family, for answers. Margo was open with the media and told them about Martin's ongoing dispute with the neighbors. She also said that the location where Martin's body was found was not a place that they had ever been to. She did not think that he went there and met with some kind of accident. In a statement to the press, police echoed this when they said, This is the perfect spot to make a car disappear. Hunters never go there. Javita Rodriguez spoke on behalf of her family, but just kept on saying, I saw nothing. I know nothing. That's all. Police didn't buy it. They firmly believed that the dispute with the Rodriguez family was the motive behind Martin's murder. The challenge was to establish what was the straw that finally broke the camel's back, and which member of the Rodriguez family pulled the trigger. They had a lot of evidence showing the toxic relationship between the neighbors. Martin always kept a camera on his person, incessantly filming his daily rounds. He essentially documented his entire feud with the Rodriguez family. Martin wasn't the kind of person that would back down from a fight. Margo was concerned about her husband's emotional well-being. She said, Before, he was cheerful and joking, and over time, especially in the end, he was always worried dedicated only to fight for his rights and for what he considered to be fair. Martin was not obsessive, but he could not live with injustice. She tried to persuade him to keep his distance from the neighbors, but she knew he would never give up. For a while, Martin channeled his anger into a creative enterprise. He started writing an online comic strip that a friend was going to illustrate. It was a humorous take on the rural terrorism he experienced. His characters were based on himself and Margot and their neighbors. He continued recording every encounter with Manolo, Javita, and their sons. The footage, some of which can be seen in the documentary film Santa Uea, is rather disturbing. Martin asks Manolo what he's up to, then Manolo starts hitting him with a stick. The camera distorts as Martin falls to the ground, then the screen fades to black. Four months before he disappeared, Martin reached out to El País newspaper. He relayed the story of the open-air refuse site and said that despite his efforts to clean the place up, no one was listening. On the contrary, he faced serious resistance regarding the issue. To support his story, he sent a video to a journalist in which the intellectually challenged Carlos can be heard saying, I'm going after you. You're nice and fat now, and ready for killing. Carlos had a rifle with him at the time, carrying it in a sling over his shoulder. The question that caused this response came from Martin, who asked if he was going after Bohr. Martin was genuinely scared of the slow-witted Carlos. He told the journalist, They've already attacked me with the axe, with sticks, with sickles. Any day now, Carlos will shoot me. He's got the brains of a ten-year-old boy, and when he gets nervous, he yells, I'm going to get my rifle. Other videos also reveal how the Rodriguez family ran their farm. Disturbing footage of animal cruelty showing sick or dying animals on their property. 
Once animals died, rotting corpses were simply left out in the open or dumped in the water. The yard was strewn with old broken down kitchen appliances, a rusty car, and other trash. Police watched the videos and saw how tensions between the neighbors increased. It was a volcano of anger, waiting to erupt. Plainclothes detectives decided to spend some time in Santa Uea to keep an eye on Margot's neighbors. They spoke to Julio, Carlos, Javita, and sometimes Manolo, but tried to keep it casual and win their trust. Four months after Martin's remains were found, investigators bumped into Carlos in the rubbled up street of Santa Uea. They started talking with him about everyday things like the weather and the farm. Then, they touched on the topic of firearms, seeing as Carlos had his rifle with him at the time. He boasted how his shotgun didn't fail him when he needed it. He said, He came with the car like a tolo. I took the shotgun, boom boom, I hid, and they looked for me. Carlos spoke incoherently. He sometimes referred to himself in the third person, other times in the first, which made it hard to understand whom he was talking about. Investigators were stunned. Was it Martin Carlos referred to as the man driving like a tolo, a madman? Up to this point, the Civil Guard were investigating Julio Rodriguez and their other brother, Jesus. They had tapped the family's phones and hid recording devices in their cars. A phone call made from Julio's house by his wife revealed that Julio wasn't himself since Martin's car was discovered. Another conversation between Julio and Carlos proved that Julio was preparing Carlos, coaching him on what to say to the police. Investigators never suspected Carlos, but now it seemed that he knew more than they thought. When police returned a week after his statement about shooting the driver of a car to question Carlos again, his mother Javita refused. She said that he was tired and he had to help his brother in the afternoon and told the officers to go away. They did, but returned with a warrant for his arrest. On Saturday, November 29, 2014, six months after Martin's remains were found, police arrested 47-year-old Juan Carlos Rodriguez Gonzalez. He confessed to killing his neighbor the following day while under house arrest. His brother Julio, 51, was also arrested and admitted to his role in the murder. After years of wondering how Martin's life ended, Margot finally heard the whole story. The brothers both said that Martin died on the day he disappeared, Tuesday, the 19th of January, 2010. It was a cold and foggy day in the Galician Hills. Carlos spent most of the morning with his mother, slaughtering a pig and making sausages. After lunch, he went for a walk in Santa Uea and, as always, flung his shotgun over his shoulder. He saw Martin's green Chevrolet blazer darting into the valley and flagged him down. Martin made the fatal decision to stop and hear him out. He rolled his window down and asked what was wrong. Carlos exploded, scolding him for driving recklessly. The argument spiraled out of control and Carlos shot Martin in the chest with his 12 caliber hunting rifle. Then, he went to hide so no one could find him. Carlos said that he shot Martin because he wanted to be a hero, to show his family that he could save them from the man who had been causing them so many problems. Julio said that on the afternoon of the murder, he was driving his tractor loaded with grass for his cows through town when he found Martin's body slumped in the driver's seat of his car, the engine still running. Out of fear that people would think he was the one who killed his neighbor, Julio decided to hide Martin's car and body. Carlos came along and Julio asked him to help move Martin's body to the passenger seat. Then Julio drove the Chevrolet Blazer to Tuzas da Azarera, 11 miles from Santa Uea, where Martin's remains were eventually found. Julio claimed that smoke began to come out of the car and that the car caught on fire. He got out, pulled Martin's body out, covered it with pine branches and set it alight. He removed the license plates from the burning car to hinder identification. This was quite a futile exercise, seeing as Martin's car was very unique. Julio then walked all the way back to his family's farm, through the mist and snow. He never said a word about it for four years. According to Julio, the matter was never discussed in their home. He said, If I had known that Martin was dead, I would not have gone up to the village. I could see that his death was going to happen to him at any time because he picked on people, even if they hadn't done anything to him. Forensic test results confirmed that Martin's cause of death was most likely a gunshot wound. Only 13% of the skeleton was ever recovered from the scene in the Pine Forest. 
The prosecutor said the answer to how he died could be found in the other 87%. A gunshot wound presumably shattered his chest bone, which would explain why that was never found. But then again, the area was crawling with wolves and wild boars who could have taken the remains. The prosecutor pointed out that if the bullet fired from Carlos's rifle hit Martin in the shoulder, he could have been alive but unconscious when Julio found him. So if Julio had called an ambulance or taken him to the hospital, who knows? Perhaps he could have been saved. It's just something that we'll never know. A psychological profile concluded that Juan Carlos's mental disability was of such that he did not realize the consequences of his actions. He was, however, fit to stand trial. The case was brought to court in June 2018, four years after his arrest. In the dock, Carlos cried like a child. He also sucked his thumb whenever he became overwhelmed. But there was no one to comfort him. While he was in remand, both Manolo and Javita had passed away. Because of his disability, Prosecutor Miguel Ruiz agreed to reduce the charges against Carlos to second-degree murder. He argued that although Carlos was able to tell right from wrong, good from evil, he was not capable of planning the murder. It was not a premeditated incident, rather a confrontation gone horribly wrong. In the end, Carlos Rodriguez was sentenced to 10 and a half years in prison. He was also ordered to pay 50,000 euro to Martin's widow, Margot. Julio was released and given a restraining order for 25 years, prohibiting him from going anywhere near the village where he was born and raised and lived all his life, Santa Uea. His cattle remained, and Margot took them in. Margot said that she never would have thought that the mentally disabled Carlos was the one who had killed Martin. She always thought of him as a child, disturbed but harmless. She believed that he hated Martin because of the stories his family told about him. They essentially loaded the gun, and he pulled the trigger. The case has garnered some international attention. When Martin first went missing, renowned Dutch crime reporter Peter R. de Vries traveled to Santa Uea to interview Margot, hoping to find answers. New York Times reporter Jeffrey Gray, who was known for investigating and sometimes solving cold cases, also visited Santa Uea to do a story. First-time filmmakers Andrew Becker and Daniel Mara made the documentary film Santa Uea a gripping insight into the relationship between the Rodriguez family and Martin, as told by Margot and Javita. Mayor's brother arrived to volunteer on the farm the very same day Martin went missing in 2010. Today, Margot lives in the village by herself. She has no intention of leaving, as her farm is where she feels closest to Martin. Volunteers still make the pilgrimage to Centro Amahula to learn from her and find inspiration in her way of living, completely organic, off the land. But when volunteers go back home, Margot is all alone again. For the most part, she's surrounded by nothing but solitude, goats, and memories of a life that could have been. We'd like to thank today's sponsors, Noom. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence. That is Noom, N O O M dot com forward slash evidence. Also, we'd like to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, Best Fiends. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in Apple Podcast or wherever you're listening right now. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.